Welcome to Healing Generations, a podcast creating a dialogue uplifting the importance of healing, strengthening, and supporting our communities, and that addresses the disparities and inequities in communities of color. Healing Generations is brought to you by the Healing Generations Institute, a collaborative initiative of the National Compadres Network and the Brotherhood of Elders. Be sure to subscribe to stay up to date on our new releases. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, this is Jerry Teo, and uh, I just want to say welcome. Thank you for being here with us here on the Healing Generations podcast. Again, here on this journey, you know, trying to lift up and, and acknowledge the, you know, the generations of, of medicine and traditions and values that, that our people and our ancestors have provided us. But at the same time, creating an avenue for, uh, for generations of healing. You know, we recognize the that journey for, for our grandmas and grandpas and great relatives, you know, they went through some stuff and still going through some things. And so we're trying to learn about that so that we can, you know, create a, a way to stop some of that trauma and create uh, next generations that have, you know, more blessings and less, less trauma that way. And, and put on by the National Compadres Network in conjunction with Brotherhood of Elders and, and just really uh, blessed and pleased that you joined us today. You know, we want to begin the way we always do, just thanking Creator, thanking God, thanking the ancestors, you know. And as you, wherever you're at, if you're able to, just take a deep breath, you know, and bring it in. And, you know, just acknowledge the breath, acknowledge gratitude for being able to breathe. And and um, and as you sit there, you know, want to acknowledge your ancestors, whoever, wherever you come from, whatever roots you have. Some of us have two or three roots, and, you know, that's good. Bring all the grandmas in, you know, and acknowledge all of them, whatever part of you. All of you is sacred, the whole part of you. And so we want to acknowledge those ancestors. And at the same time, wherever you're at, wherever you're sitting, acknowledge the relatives of that land, you know, the original caretakers of that land, but also also the people that are living in your community and your family. You know, this is for, for all of us that way. And we thank you for joining us today. I'm really, really overjoyed today because I get to sit here and, and, and dialogue and talk with a, a friend of mine. You know, just uh, I consider her a sister. You know, really a, a wonderful elder now, and you know, wisdom keeper, comadre. You know, we uh, we were just talking <laughs> before. We've been on some for some you know some journeys where we've laughed a lot, and then we've cried a lot, and struggled a lot, all in the uh, force of of trying to make the world better. You know, and so I'm really really happy to uh, to bring with us today uh, Alba Moreno, who uh, you know I've known for a long time. We worked together. The East LA Rape Hotline back then, you know, and and uh, really working on a lot of different things. But she's really been a uh, a leader, you know, wisdom keeper and an advocate, a really really strong truth speaker to justice and peace and healing and relationships. And so, Alba, I just want to welcome you and thank you for being here and give you the opportunity to welcome uh, the people that are listening. Thank you, Jerry. It's a pleasure and it's a blessing for me too to uh, be invited to spend this time with you. And I just want to say uh, welcome and hello to everybody out there. And uh, just let's just have a great conversation, a good platica, embrace our knowledge and what we're going to share with each other. And uh, again, you know, I just feel like I'm sitting in a living room with you and we're just going to go ahead and have this wonderful session and this wonderful platica, reminisce yeah. and share, like you say, our journey. It uh, has been a long one, uh, but a beautiful one, you know, ups and downs, but uh, overall, I'm blessed to have uh, friends like you in my life who have mm. made my journey very sacred. So thank mm. you again, and everybody, welcome. Thank you, thank you, Alva. Now I want to begin by uh, by just you know inviting you to share a little bit about you know Alva, about who you are and your journey. You know your your family, your people, where are you from, and and a little bit about you know your your journey through throughout your life. You know, as much as you want to share. So let's just start there. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I want to start out by saying that uh, I am a mother to a wonderful, great son who uh, has blessed me with grandchildren. I have two granddaughters and my higher power has allowed me to live long enough to now be able to embrace the title of uh, great grandmother. I have mm. a beautiful little great grandson. Uh, his name is Leo. He is the joy of our life right now. You know, I I look back at my life and I think, wow, I was surrounded by blessings all the time. But when you're young, you don't realize it because we're so busy with all other things, you know, of, of adolescence, of uh, of youth, of young adulthood. 
But I was blessed to be raised in my home with my nana, uh, who is, um, she's passed away, of course, but she was yaki. Mm. And uh, she lived in our home with our, our yaki ways, our Mexican uh, ways. She was originally from uh, Villa de Ceres, outside of Hermosillo, Sonora. Mm. And uh, my tata from Monterrey, El Paso, that was this way the El Paso area, but these were my um, maternal grandparents. I never got to meet my maternal grandparents. But having my nana in the home, I now realize what a blessing, what a blessing. Mm. And as you get older, you start to reflect, well, I did, on how blessed I was. And I started to embrace her teachings. You know, we take it for granted. We Mm -hmm. take it for granted, or I did anyway, that it was the way it was. And, you know, this is who she was and this is how we lived and I didn't appreciate who she really was and the blessings that she really brought to our family until I was probably in my later years, probably around my 40s and my 50s. Mm. And I started to get a little bit of that information when I started working actually with you, Jerry. And that was in the 80s, I believe, or the 90s. And I started to reflect as you would do some teachings for us on, again, you know, our, our indigenous ways how we, it was important to embrace who we were, uh, embrace who we were as Chicanos, as Americans of Mexican descent, I started to get the memory back and mm. started to reflect, wow, this is what my Nana was trying to say to us. This is what my Nana had already taught us. So I really learned to appreciate that and try and get my life guided by those teachings. I was a single mom. And again, I was blessed to be surrounded by what I call fairy godmothers, other sisters, <laughs> other brothers that guided me and and took me through the journey of knowing that it wasn't the end of the world. I had not committed a mortal sin, uh, mm. getting pregnant at 17 and getting married, getting divorced before 25. You know, those are strong values in our uh, culture. And uh, again, you know, feeling the sense of I had failed my family, I had failed myself. But I was very blessed to meet other young women that looked like me that were going through the same journey, Mm. that taught me, that encouraged me to return back to school, encouraged to continue to tell my story, to continue to embrace and share my teachings with other young women. And, you know, here I am today. I I got through school. I got through, you know, the, the journey of raising my son. I met along the way a very, very uh, wonderful man. Uh, unfortunately, John, he passed away four years ago. I am now also mm-hmm. hold the title of widow, mm-hmm. uh, but I hold it with a lot of pride and that sadness because I was married to a wonderful Chicano who embraced me. And I think you remember him too, Jerry. Uh, yeah. John was with us in all our journeys as well. Oh, yeah. I miss him dearly. But again, uh, another life lesson that we go through. And um, I know he's with me all the time. And so, yeah, I've, I've had a very full life, ups and downs, but uh, all along, blessed that I have been able to grasp those teachings of the past and keep moving forward. Mm, And here I am today, you know, (laughs) retired, semi-retired, living in Tucson, Arizona. I miss Los Angeles dearly, and I try to get back there uh, every other month because I still do a lot of consultant work with the East Los Angeles Women's Center and Mm -hmm. also with the YWCA of Greater Los Angeles, where I ended up retiring from as Mm -hmm. the Director of Sexual Assault Services. I oversaw three rape crisis centers for the YWCA, one in, located in Compton, Long Beach, and South Los Angeles. And then prior to that, I had been the executive director for the East LA Women's Center for about 17 years. Mm. So a lot of teachings, a lot of uh, great friends have, uh, you know, uh, colleagues that have become dear friends and I stay in touch with and um, I continue. I was, mm-hmm. I'm was i supposed to be retired. I retired supposedly in 2015. <laughs> But I continue to provide a uh, service, a consultant with both those agencies that I mentioned. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that's who I am. And now I'm embracing, you know, my 70s. I love my life right now. I love living in Tucson and I continue to really have the passion for the work that I do. Mm, wow. Yeah. You know, the journey really takes us, as you said, takes us through, you know, through a lot of little ups and downs. And, and we learn many, many things, you know, along the way. You know, and, and as you say, sometimes when we're in the midst of it, I, I know with my grandma, I, you know, I thought I thought my grandma was crazy. 
You know, just exactly. some of the things you did. You know, she would go outside and talk to the plants. Mira que bonitas rosas. You know, what are you talking to the plants for? Mira, te voy a agarrar un pedazo. I'm going to get a little piece here because I got to make a tea. Why are you talking to the plants? Why are you asking for permission? I didn't understand, you know, her mm -hmm. her honoring everything that grew. You know, everything that grew. I didn't understand those ways and didn't understand you know, how they were trying to teach us, you know, to respect all of life that way, you know. And so, so there's a lot that you learn and there's a lot that we go through that we can learn from too, you know, some of the trancasos, the, you know, you mentioned some of the things that you struggled with, you know. But, but I was wondering, as you reflect back, you know, now, and what were the challenges? What, what did you find were the major challenges for you? But also, what were the major lessons that helped you uh, get through? Well, you know, it's interesting because, again, you don't pay attention when you're in the midst of it until you step out and you look from the outside in, right? But after I got divorced, I was uh, 23 years old, and I relocated from Tucson, Arizona to Los Angeles. And when I got to Los Angeles, I didn't realize how segregated and mm. discriminated I had been and I had grown up in what segregation and the discrimination that my parents had gone through my grandparents until I got exposed, you know, to the Chicano movement and uh, human rights issues that we were not really having access to. Our schools were very segregated here in Tucson. You know, the Latino kids were kept in one corner, the Native American children uh, in another. And then, you know, the, the Gavachos, the Anglos, they had the say-so and the run of the of the city. And all, all those things you just take for granted. You know, my nana and tata would make it a point to tell us not to bring attention. Quedes en calladitos. No hagan tanto ruido. No, que no, no, no hagan las cosas. Don't do stuff that's going to bring a t attention to you. Mm. And now I realize those those are always, that's how they survive. Not bringing attention to themselves for fear of what might happen to them or, you know, getting arrested or losing, I don't know, what whatever little bit they had. And I realized how and what, uh, how can I say, in what a rut we were, for a better word. But mm -hmm. we just mm -hmm. went along and, and lived that way, right? Mm -hmm. And so I started to become exposed to my civil rights, to my human rights, that, you know, that's not the way to live. That's not the way you treat people. That's not how mm -hmm. we should be getting treated. My family and my ancestors should not be struggling like that. So that was quite a challenge. But the beauty was, again, I met young people in my same generation, my same age group that were, you know, trailblazers. They were fighters. Mm. They were leaders and they were leading the way. And I learned those ways and I got my self-esteem built to realize that I deserve better. I, mm. I could do much better. I did have the right to go to school and pursue a higher degree. I did have the right to speak up. I did have the right as a, a woman, as a mujer, to take a stance for who I was for, for my own human rights. You know, decisions about my own body, decisions about my children, decisions about the kind of work I wanted to do, uh, being able to feel comfortable having uh, candid conversations with other men and, and not feel that I had to be kept in my place as, as mm. you know, uh, yeah. we were taught that as a mujer, as a young Latina, young, young Chicana, you had to act a certain way. And of course, always with respect, always understanding that, but not, not losing my voice. I didn't have to keep my voice silent. I had a voice and I had the right to speak up for others. And that's what I've been doing. I've been do really using my voice to speak up for those individuals that don't have the voice, just like I didn't at one time, at one time, and letting them know that you do have a voice and you have to learn how to utilize it. You know, the, the, those were the, the challenges that I faced. And again, you know, uh, th let's be real, uh, discrimination. I was in jobs where I was too vocal. They didn't want me there because mm. I, you know, I was maybe the only Latina, the only Chicana, and speaking up and saying, hey, why are we not doing this? Why are the services not in Spanish? You know, why don't we have childcare? You're, you're providing a service in a predominantly uh, Latino community, East L.A., for example, and there's, there was barriers that got in the way of getting clients. And they would say, well, why don't they come? How come they don't come? Well, make this place look uh, inviting. You know, mm. if you want this community to respond, it has to feel like their home. It has to look like their their place to, to come, you know. So anyway, that's sort of been my uh, challenge and mm -hmm. my struggle, for a better word, always trying to make things happen for our community 
in an equitable uh, way. Yeah. You know, and 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 I think that's uh, that's kind of when I when I met you. You mm-hmm. know, you were you were on that journey and and speaking up and. You know, when I met you, you were at the what was then the East LA Rape Hotline. You know, really Correct. advocating for for the uh, the rights of, of of women, and and speaking up against the sexual assault and sexual violence and even domestic violence. And I wonder if you can talk to us about how you got into that work. How did that work get introduced to you, or or how did you become involved in 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 that work? Well, it's interesting because I identify as a child survivor of domestic violence. Unfortunately, Mm. I lived in a home where my father, you know, had his challenges and he was very violent and very abusive to my mother, probably for about 30 years. Mm. And, you know, you just sort of grow up, you keep those things behind your door, closed doors, you know, you don't talk about it. Uh, Maybe it's happening to others, but you sort of just keep it a secret. Nobody talks about it. So that's how I grew up, you know. My rescue was my nana. You know, when there was going stuff going on, I knew that I could just go to my nana's and stay there. She protected us from being in the environment, but the environment was there and it was real. So now fast forward, you know, I get married. And when I got married, I said, I will never allow anybody to treat me in this way. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, I will never marry an individual that's going to be like my father with his anger and You know, what happens? You end Mm -hmm. up the same uh, scenario, right? And that's what happened to me. So I knew I didn't want to. So I got out of that relationship and I knew in order to stay safe, I had to get far away. And Mm -hmm. so I moved. I moved from Tucson to be away from that environment, both my parents and my son's father. And then I'm blessed. You know, they say things happen for a reason. And I Mm -hmm. know my higher power put me there with the the women of the East LA rape, Rape Hotline. And I had a friend who had been assaulted and she called me, not knowing, I knew nothing. Uh, she called me one early Saturday morning and she says, this happened to me. I don't know what to do. And so I went to her house and I said, well, I don't know. What do we do? What do we do? So I call 911 or 411. I don't know which one it was. I don't know. 911 <laughs> yeah. is the emergency. And I think it was the 411 you dialed for mm-hmm. the, the telephone, right? So right away they tell me um, that there's a organization called East LA Rape Hotline. Do I want the number? So I said, okay, give it to me. And so they talked to her and she hangs up and she says, oh, next Saturday, she says, they're having a meeting and you're going to go with me. I go, I'm not going anywhere. I said, no, Saturdays, <laughs> I stay home, clean house. And besides, I don't have a babysitter. She goes, no, she says, they said it's potluck and you can bring the kids. Mm. So the rest is history. So I show up at that event and I meet the wonderful Irene Mendez, Connie mm. Destito, gosh, I, you know, Rita Ledesma, all these Chicanas that are now also semi-retired became wonderful social workers. Unfortunately, Irene has passed on. But Mm -hmm. I show up at this event with my friend. And like they say, there is a history. You know, I walk into this room uh, robust with laughter and energy. And again, young Chicanas that look just like me, the kids in the corner playing, you know, talking about how they were getting accepted to uh, graduate school. Uh, you know, Connie says she had just gotten back and gotten her bachelor's in San Jose. All this energy, you know, women in school, their mm. kids. And I I just thought, wow, you know, this is totally what I didn't uh, expect. So lo and behold, I stayed connected with them. I started to continue to go to the meetings. Next thing I know, I'm being uh, recruited to become one of the volunteers on the hotline. Mm. I took the training. Uh, I learned so much, again, about who we were as young Latinas, Chicanas, introduced to different authors and artists. And I, I mean, it was just wonderful. And then along the road, I meet you, you know, and I meet Teresa Contreras and all the wonderful uh, individuals that have become part of my life. You know, now we're lifelong friends, I, you know. Mm. Teresa was just here with me for a week. I, I stay connected with you. Uh, you know, I, I still talk to Raquel, uh, Salinas, who was part of our team. So, I mean, how long was this? 30 some years ago? We're going on 40 yeah. years. I mean, yeah. lifelong friends. And so, like they say, the rest is history. I got involved. I stayed involved. And I went back to school. I had the support from the, the women there at East LA Rape Hotline at the time, now East LA Women's Center. I continue to stay involved. Now a, a great friend and mentor to me is also Barbara Coppos, who is now the director. And gosh, I mean, we mm-hmm. could probably sit and just talk and talk yeah. about all the good times, the memories of those relationships and the good work that we have done together. You know, 
I mean, who who, who else? I mean, I, I I never thought I'd be on stage. I was on stage with you with when we did the triato, <laughs> una familia yeah. buena y sana. You know, we yeah, got to travel. Yeah. We went to New York. I could say I I was on stage in New York, right? <laughs> uh, San Antonio, throughout the state of California, we had so much fun and we did such healing work. What an mm. experience, right? Yeah, yeah, that we yeah. healed and we were again an example. People saw themselves in us in that play and. At that point, I realized, wow, they're experiencing what I did. They're seeing people that look like them, that are talking about the same problems, the same dilemmas. And I know we healed. We healed so many people along the way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, what you're talking about, and let me just kind of share with the audience, as, as part of what was going on, I, you know, I, I ended up kind of, you know, and it's not magically, I know it's not magic. It was all, it, all of this was orchestrated by, by you know, Creator and the Ancestors, how we end up places, and I, and I was doing work on on child abuse and child sex abuse at the time. And Teresa asked me if I could come and help because there was a, a upsurge of child sex abuse in communities. McMartin, mm -hmm. you know, right. case had just broken, and nothing was being done bilingually or biculturally for the Latino community. And so asked if you know uh, she'd gotten a grant, asked if I could come help do something, and we developed a teatro. Right, we decided to develop a teatro, and not just one. We ended up developing several after a while, but the main one was La Familia Buena Sana, and it was really a uh, a teatro uh, uh, in which we shared about a family who encountered uh, incident of, of sexual abuse and the feelings that went on with that. And and you were the comadre, exactly. <laughs> you were the comadre. You were I the was the comadre. comadre. I you loved the com it. You were the comadre in there that really was the one that helped. Uh, navigate the healing, navigate getting the secret out, being able to share about what went on and and what, you know, when we did this play, you know, families saw themselves and saw their own dilemma, their own hurt, their own trauma. And I know you remember that every time we performed, a bunch of people would come up, and especially to you, mujeres, a lot of women would come up, a lot of mothers, even young girls would come up to talk to you, Right. And that mm -hmm. became the entry point for a lot of women and mothers and families healing because it was a secret. You don't talk about that, you know. And I understand for why. We understood why. You know, there's many families that are, that are undocumented, and so you don't want to call because you're afraid, you know, something's going to happen. You don't want to call, you know, Child Protective Service or police because they'll take your kids away, you know. And we understood, along with the racism and discrimination, that our families were targeted when something was wrong in our families, they would take our children away. They would just put them in in prison. They would deport them. They would do all of these things. And and there weren't a lot of services, uh, especially for mujeres and bilingual women. And, and I think, you know, I know that, you know, you and Raquel and, and a lot of the other women, you know, Teresa, and you were the trailblazers to really bring voice for mujeres, for women, to recognize that this is not okay and there's places to interrupt that cycle but also places to heal. And, you know, and, and we did travel. We, you know, after that, we then did the payasos, you know, the cariñosos. Exactly. We, we did a little acto when we'd go into the schools and then we'd go into the preschools even, you know. And right. we had a little song, cariño, cariño, para ti y para mí, con respeto y confianza y dignidad, cha, cha, cha. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, for the little kids, we sang songs that talked about values and how you needed to be treated with respect and dignity and love and and trust and all of that. And, you know, and you were part of that, you know. I wonder if you can share a little bit, you know, about um, that for our listeners, about the importance of, you know, recognizing that, that you know, disrespect or violence or, or anything in relationships, you know, is, is not part of our culture. It's not part of who we really are. And it's something that we really need to heal. Exactly. And I'm glad you're bringing that up because I always go back and reflect on my dad. You know, the stereotype that, uh, Mexicano men, Latino men are more violent, African-American, always put in the blame that men of color are more violent than other men. And, you know, through this journey of working with you and working in this field, help me heal and help me get to a better place with both my parents. I used to resent my mom and say, how could you be so stupid? How did you stay? How come you don't leave? Blah, blah, blah. And then with my dad, it was this whole anger towards the idea that he was this mean man, this horrible person. And as I did this work and became educated, I got to understand 
Our men are not born veterans. Our men are not born with the title of you're going to be an abusive person and you're going to beat up. That's the learned behavior. And as I started to reflect on my father, I realized he did have a lot of legitimate anger. I'm not excusing how he expressed it, but I'm understanding. And I think that this is important. My dad was an orphan. He lost his parents at a very young age. He went to World War II. He was raised in a home where he was really abused by his uncles. He would tell me stories that his grandma, his dad's mother took him in because his father also left and later on passed away. He was nine years old when his mother died. He ended up in the custody of his grandmother. But the older uncles were very jealous of him because she would spoil him. Le tenía cariño, like nanas do, you know. Mm. Le tenía la lastima. She was felt so, so a lot of compassion for him because he was this little boy that was an orphan. But the older uncles would take on that, you know, attitude of, ah, oh, don't be a crybaby and, and do this and do that. And always, you know, teasing him and uh, badgering him. And again, so much pain there and so much abuse, so much trauma that nobody addressed, right? And then my mom is of the generation of, you know, the shame of being divorced, the shame of, you know, you're not being able to control your husband. Uh, If you left the marriage, you were abandoning the matrimonio, the marriage, all those things that I got to understand and learn and get to a place of peace with myself, with my parents. And what I say to the audience is this, learn about what's going on Pay attention to that pain. If you don't understand it, seek the help. Mm. You know, there's help out there. We're a community that we're ready to heal each other, embrace it. It just reflects me back to this whole situation with this heartbreak incident in Uvalde de Texas with these young babies, these children. Again, I'm not making excuses, but what was so involved in the pain and trauma that an 18 year old, this Mm -hmm. Young shooter was 18 years old. Where did he fall through the cracks? What happened? What happened? There had to have been signs there early on. If this child was already mentally, had mental health issues, somebody did not recognize them or they ignored them. But what happened? What happened that at 18, you have such rage, such sentimiento, such, oh, coraje, you know, that you, you just want to hurt somebody else so much, mm-hmm. right? So again, I, I, you know, to the listeners, we don't have to suffer trauma alone. We don't have to suffer pain alone. Uh, there's remedios, there's remedies, you know, uh, through counseling, through spiritual healing, through just different things that we can do. But mainly I would say, seek the help of a support system through counseling, through a therapist, through you know, somebody that you know, you trust, and it's going to listen and, and help you understand. Because that's all it is. All it takes is just a conversation and being able to have somebody validate and say, you know what? You're not going crazy. Everything mm-hmm. you've shared with me and everything you've gone through, of course you're feeling like this. You know? And again, there's still so much work to do. There's still so much work to do. But we have to do it within the realm of our teachings just like you have been doing, you have healed so many young men, you know? And again, our our young men need that that healing and so do our our young women. But at the same time, so many uh, of our children are falling through the cracks. Well, you know, I I know because I've seen it and I saw it when when we were working together and even in the theater when we were traveling together and, you know, the, the importance of having you know, people that look like you, that have come from the same experience, that speak your language, uh, that speak your experience, uh, for you to be able to go to them, you know. And I appreciate, I appreciate really you lifting up the the pain of your father because, you know, I mean, hurt people hurt people. Absolutely. And, and many of our, you know, many of our, our men, as you said, no excuse, but many of our men and women, you know, are are hurting. And we need to be able to to recognize that that you know, and I also want to say this publicly that you know, violence and domestic violence and sexual assault, patriarchy, 
misogyny is not part of our true culture. It's a no, learned it's behavior. It's part of the colonization. It's part of what we have adapted. But now in many of our families, it's seeped in and people think that's just who we are. No, it's not who we are. That's what we've learned and that's what we've done to cope. But in the same way, we can heal from those things. We can, you know, we can unlearn and decolonize and release and shed and let go, you know. And I think, you know, I saw that part of us too. As we traveled, you know, we laughed and we joked and and the music and the laughter and the really the 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 love for each other. You know, that's why we're still friends today and we have so many people because we healed through love. We Absolutely. shared with love, you know, for our people, for each other that way, you know, and and I saw you do it and you're still doing it, you know, so much so. Can you talk a little bit about the, because I know you're still doing this work, you're still doing consultation and, you know, uh, but I also want to give you give you a, a, an opportunity to talk about the little tiendita you got too, you know, because that's a, it's a different part of the, a part of part of your legacy there, because I know in, in that same way, you know, when people come to your store, you talk to them the same way and you're still counseling and you're still doing that in a different way. So can you talk about both those things, the sure. kind of the... Well, you you know me so well. You know me so well because what you're saying about the tiendita is absolutely we have so the resources. So talk, talk about the, the store. What's the name of absolutely. the store? And... Well, uh, well, again, you know, I still do a lot of work. This has been my life work. I have the passion. It's my mission. I've been sent. I just uh, uh, how can I say? It's a gift that I now recognize and I know yeah. I I possess, and that gift is of helping, helping others, doing for others. But, you know, after a while, you, it also, you have to take a step back and set some boundaries because it does become um, takes a, toll. a carga. It becomes overwhelming. And yeah. you realize how vicariously this stories of others and the pain of others can absorb your own soul, your own mm-hmm. mind. And so yeah. I had to remove myself. And I do. I don't do direct services. If I have to, I will. But I'm doing more staff training and development and helping with grant writing and that administrative part. So uh, along the way, I had always said that I wanted to someday have a thrift shop. You know, I love thrift mm. shops and segunditas <laughs> and so. Well, I come to Tucson, I retire, and my poor John, I could only be at home six months. I said, John, I got to go find a job. I can't, uh, this retirement thing is not for me. He loved just kicking back and watching TV or whatever. I go, nope, I got to do something. So I applied at the local uh, domestic violence shelter here. Mm. And when I went to the interview, I said, I want to do anything. I will clean toilets. I'll sweep the yard. I just don't want to do direct services. I'll Mm -hmm. be there and let me just, you know, maybe run a few support groups or whatever, but I'm not doing one-on-one. Sure enough, I get there. I'm having fun sitting in the, in the smoking area with a secondhand smoke from the mujeres who (laughs) are smoking. I'm in the kitchen helping them cook. I'm doing everything except direct services. And then I get to meet this other Chicana woman, uh, my dear friend, Lina Prieto Hill. She happened to be from L.A., was retired, uh, semi-retired, living here in Tucson. And we got to talking about thrift shopping. And she said, I have a garage full. I said, I just moved 36 years of Mm. uh, stuff from L.A. to Tucson. I said, I have a garage full. So we got to talking. And then, you know, next thing we know, we said, well, why don't we start a little tiendita or do something? And sure enough, we were blessed. We were cruising one day up and down here in the, in South Tucson, the barrio. And there's this little tiny little makeshift sign uh, that says for rent. It's a little corner shop. We go in there. We The rent was exactly what we needed. And this place was waiting for us. It already has mm. shelving. It has a counter, the space. And to make a long story long and shorter, uh, we got it. We called it the, and we named it Las Dos Comadres. <laughs> a local thrift shop. We have all kinds of nice stuff, collectibles and, you know, cool clothes and vintage, a little bit of everything for everybody. Mm. And sure enough, the word got out that these two semi-retired, you know, social workers from the local shelter here are running this place. So what happens? We have women coming in who they're battered. They, mm. They've they been thrown out of the house. We give them clothes again. We give them water. We give them resources where to call. We help them find a shelter. Uh, we help dress if, if uh, uh, anybody has to appear in court uh, for whatever male or female, especially custody cases. We role play with them. This is how you answer. We dress them up so they go in there, you know, looking very professional, cover up all their tattoos, tell them, hey, this is the game you got to play. 
yes, sir, no, sir. You listen, you take a notepad, you take notes of everything that's being discussed in court. Anything you don't understand, you ask your attorney. We just really, how can I say for a better word, help them get through the system that way. Mm. Um, and again, you know, the majority of the folks that we're seeing is homeless uh, women. We have a lot of homelessness here in Tucson as well as, uh, as we know across the country. So, yes, we're still doing the work that we do, the social working, <laughs> you know, getting women into shelter, getting them into the hotlines, finding them the clothes, you know. I mean, one lady, for example, came in. She's from Hermosillo. She was sobbing and she just walked in there. She didn't know what we were. She was sobbing that she had gotten notice that her daughter had passed away of cancer mm. and she didn't have any money. She was selling her jewelry and everything and said she needed to get on the bus. And the bus was living in a couple of hours. I don't know what. She was work, carrying a little mochila, her little suitcase that she had to, just sobbing, sobbing that her daughter had died. Well, we gave her the money. We bought her the bus ticket. What could we do? Mm, you yeah. know, and mm. that was like, we had made $100 that day and the $100 <laughs> went, went with her. But, you know, I've also learned that we pay it forward. You know, those $100 will turn into 300 for us. Mm, mm, and it has. You know what I mean? Yeah. So just being grateful for what we have, willing to share what you have and doing it with respect and honor and true conviction, you know, not expect anything back. I mean, we just, if you're going to help, you're going to help. You don't expect anything back. You're mm. doing it because that's what you know you have to do. That's what your heart moves you to do. And so here we are. So if you're in wow. Tucson, Arizona, yeah. come by Las Los Comadres. We're a little thrift shop there in South Tucson along the same path of the best uh, Mexican restaurants in Tucson. Really? Okay. Yeah. So how, next how time people, you, so, so we'll post something after on how people can uh, connect with you or find, find that, the list there. But, you know, I, I just want to acknowledge, you know, Alba, that, you know, what you're doing is the way that our people have done it for generations. You know, there was no social services. There was no, you know, uh, health care. You know, there was the tienditas, there was the barber shops, there was the beauty shops, there was the the little places in which people would help each other. You know, it wasn't, you didn't have to have a degree, you didn't have to have a credential, you know, people helped each other that way, you know. Mm -hmm. And you, when you have that gift, you, you know, the way you you have the gift and your comadre has that gift too, it's not something you can turn off and turn on. But the other thing that I, I just want to acknowledge is the the heart and the generosity that you have. Oh, thank you. That you've always had, you know? And I think when we're talking about how we work with our people, how we heal people, how we, uh, you know, get people to listen and to transform their hurt, it's because of that love and generosity. It's because of that love and that compassion that you have. And, you know, it, it's unfortunate that when we send people to school to learn this, there isn't, you know, a, a whole semester just on that, on that love, compassion, and generosity, you know. And as you said, you give and don't expect it back. You just provide and, and you know, so, so I, I want to acknowledge that that's a central part of who we are as a people and how we survive. It's how the mujeres have kept us as a people. The women have always guided us. They've always nurtured us. They've always, the sana, sana, colita, rana. They always gave us something to heal us. And, you know, what a blessing you know, for Tucson, that you're there and, and you have that little tiendita, but that the mujeres have some place to go. And and I want to encourage listeners and, you know, if there's funders, you know, if there's people that got extra money, hey, you can make some donations of Las Comadres over there and, and know that it's going to be given out to the community that way. Because, Absolutely. you know, that, Thank you. that sense of, you know, reciprocity comes. Yeah. I mean, we have water. We give them water. We make coffee. We have some of the mujeres that come and sit and have coffee with us, you know. Some of them have not had anything to eat. Just, of course, you know, we sort of keep it low key too, because yeah. before you know it, we'll have the whole, the <laughs> right, whole right, city right. there. Right. And if we can help, of course we would. But yeah, I mean, how can you not offer somebody a bottle of water? You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, they're in pain and, or a few, uh, a few bucks. I mean, uh, we also have to set boundaries. We have to know, yes. you know, when and when and who, right? Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you remember, Jerry. I'm just remembering. Talking about not setting boundaries. Remember, I I, I remember you <laughs> not scolding us, but telling me and Raquel to be careful because we, I some woman called and her two kids and I even took her home. I had her yes. at home. Yes, and, yes, yes. <laughs> and next, I'm laughing because I told you I I can't I can't be there at this time. I have this lady. 
what are you doing, Alva? How did you take her home? Why did you take her home? <laughs> well, she had nowhere to go. What was I going to do? Of course, yeah. that was 30 years, and I don't recommend it at all now. Please do not take anybody home, you know. Uh, but you mentioned something, I think, that, that is at the heart of, of the struggle, of the challenge. Mm-hmm. For us people that have been raised in a traditional way, have been raised that you take people in, that you feed people, that you help them, that uh, that you trust, you know, that you have faith. You know, it's hard for us when people are hurting and we're taught in school, you know, create the boundary, don't get right. too involved, you know, keep that objective, you know. It, it's hard for us when we see people that have no place to live not to take them home. And and obviously, you know, you have to be able to discern who, who you can take and all of that. But I, I want to acknowledge that part of the reason that I think there are so many people that are struggling and are homeless and are in need, because we've gone to the other extreme. We've gone to the other extreme and put so many limitations and so many policies and so many, uh, you know, barriers on giving and providing. You know, we could cure this homeless problem and this problem of poverty. There's enough abundance in this world if people would just have the mindset of what you're talking about, of giving and sharing and 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 being generous, you know. And so you're, you, you are, you know... Um, a beautiful example, but you you are that abuelita. You are that grandma that just gives Absolutely. away stuff and blesses people and gives them water. And I remember my mom, my grandma would do that or people would show up at the house. You know, people would hear the knock on the door and there comes familia and, and my mom, ah, que bueno, que papá sale. And, and my mom's feeding them. Mom, nah, don't give them what they're not going to have nothing to eat. Ah, cállese. No, but that panzón's going to eat all the cookies and ah, be quiet. And she would, you know. And I was always worried about, you know, we weren't going to have enough. My mom had the faith that give it, share it, it'll Absolutely. come back to, you know. Mm-hmm. And I've seen that, you know, I've seen that also in your life too. You know, you, you mentioned John and you mentioned, you know, he was a beautiful man. I want to acknowledge him. Thank you. You know, for, for walking with you. And I know you miss him, but I know he's still around. Yes, I know he he's is. still taking care of you. And I'm sure as you're giving out stuff and doing stuff, he say, hey, cuidado, be careful. You know, I'm sure you could hear his voice All back the there time. as well. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, as an elder, as a wisdom keeper, as someone, you know, one of our one of our leaders, you know, true leaders, uh, uh, and I'll say one of our leaders, El Corazón. You know, I wonder if as we close out today, as if uh, you can give some advice, you know, some consejos to that next generation of, especially young women that are coming through or, and maybe even you see what young women that are struggling, that are trying to figure it out and trying to figure out their role or how they can, you know, get to a better place. Maybe you can give them a couple of points of advice or some things that you've learned that that maybe uh, that might help them. Well, I would first say have faith. Definitely have faith. Do not lose faith. And I'm not just talking about, you know, spiritually, religiously. Faith in yourself. You know, sometimes we don't realize how strong and how resilient we really are. And and we have to learn how to bring those, uh, what would you call them, traits out of us Mm. more often. Uh, Young people, again, of course, we encourage education, stay well. A lot of our kids cannot afford education. Uh, Education, uh, again, is being hard to attain. And we we, want to see our kids, you know, go into college. But find a way. Find a way, if not college, a trade that's going to bring you happiness. You know, honor who you are. Know your history. I think what happens is, uh, I still see this happening. We're taught shame very early on. A shame Mm. of who we are. A shame if our parents speak with an accent. uh, Our abuelitas, if they look different, if they dress different. If we don't have a car, if we don't have all the electronics, you know, there's something wrong with us. There's something wrong with our family. Uh, We're different. But never feel shame. Difference Mm. is beautiful. Being Mm. different is not negative. Being different is just being different. You Mm -hmm. just, that's just who you are. That's what we've been blessed with. But know your your history. Really, really, uh, I think a child that grows with pride is is much richer than a child that's growing with a lot of money. Mm. Knowing who Mm. you are, you know, being just, again, pride, orgullo. You always taught us el orgullo, mm-hmm. right? It's so powerful. Young women, again, I would say, you know, take care of your bodies, understand who you are, you know, love yourself, demand the the respect that, you know, that is owed 
to you. Same mm. thing with young men. Uh, know your true value. Just know your true value. But the biggest thing is never be ashamed. If something happens that causes you shame, we can get rid of shame. Find a way and not destructive. Talk to somebody, share it with somebody that you can trust and work on yourself. Wow. Yeah. Well, that's beautiful advice. And I think that, that you know, you have lived that advice. It's, it's, it's what you uh, cultivated in others. You know, you've, you've trained a whole next generation of people below you that are now in place to do the work. And you, know, you mentioned East LA Women's Center, you know, acknowledge, you know, all the the mujeres there at the women's center and the men's, you know, there's, there's a few men there working there now too. Absolutely. But I want to acknowledge the, the women's study, East LA Women's Center and all the wonderful work that's going on there and all the other places that are reaching out. Uh, across and the trying country. To, across the country that are providing healing and protective services and, uh, you know, for women and men and, and families that way, you know. But in the end, Alba, I, you know, I, I want to, you know, I just want to thank you because, uh, I've you know shared certain things with you, but you have been a blessing in my life too. You Thank know, I you. mean it's it's been a blessing to work with you and to travel with you and laugh with you, and we had a lot of fun along the way. A lot had of some fun. great great memories and great times, and but also I know we've helped a lot of people, and I and I think uh, you know that you can feel very fulfilled that you have fulfilled your sacred purpose, and and you're still doing it. You're still doing it at that at Las Comadres over there, and you know. So, uh, you know, I'd welcome people. If you got, you got, you know, want to give a donation or something, take it to Las Comadres, and, and I'm sure Alba will will put it to use and make sure that there's extra waters there for people or whatever. But uh, come in and buy some stuff from that store too. You know, I, I, you. I've seen some some of the pictures. You got some nice stuff there. If I go to Tucson, I'm gonna go pick up some stuff. Absolutely, <laughs> you have to come to Tucson. You have to come yeah. and visit. Tucson is a beautiful city. It's I love yeah. it here. It's been my hometown, and uh, it's always been home. And I'm glad to be home. Yeah, very good. Yeah, so I'm I'm in the land of my people, and you know I love it, love it, love it here. Mm, thank you. You know, as 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 we close out today, I just want to just encourage people to stay connected. There's some people that maybe you haven't talked to in years. You know, reach out to them, reconnect. You know, uh, acknowledge people for the work that they've done or the role that they've played in your life. You know, and and you know, I heard out of Alba too, even though she didn't say it this way, forgiveness sense of compassion for for those people even you know that that may have been hurting in their life and but also then that love compassion and generosity to others to give freely to 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 share and then to be a person that can direct people when they're hurting if you're hurting and you need help then forget about the shame reach out so that you can recover the sacredness and you can release the shame so that you can then fulfill what the creator you know, brought you here to do. You know, thank you all so much and, and you know, take care of yourself, honor yourself, honor your relationships, live yourself as a blessing and share it with others. Thank you all very much and have a blessed day. I hope. For more information about Healing Generations and the Healing Generations Institute, visit nationalcompadresnetwork.org and be sure to subscribe to stay up to date with our new releases.